Hello. The unit before this one was about angels in the Hebrew Bible. Let's now move on to Islam and see what role angels played in Islamic beliefs. A very popular belief in Islam is that of Munkar and Nakir. These are the names given by the tradition to two angels whose role is to test the souls of the recently deceased while they are still in the grave. According to this tradition, the soul is asked of a series of questions about God, his prophet and the prophet's religion, and the answer to these questions will determine whether the soul will be escorted to paradise, driven to hell, or left for ages in a kind of intermediary world which the Quran calls Barzakh. As a matter of fact, this reminds one of what Jan Tavernier will talk about in the unit on the Zoroastrian Netherworld. Munkar and Nakir, the two tempters of the grave, are naturally described as terrifying figures having titanic powers and gigantic dimensions as well as tongues that cast fire whenever they open their mouths. In Islam, angels are an issue that is at least as central as in the Jewish and Christian religions. The Quran as various verses in which belief in angels is presented as an unconditional requisite of Islamic faith, as for instance in the following statement. I quote, O you who have believed, believed in Allah and his messenger and the book that he sent down upon his messenger and the scripture which he sent down before. And whoever disbelieves in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the last day has certainly gone far astray. The Quran also names a few angels individually, such as Gabriel, Michael, or, as in this beautiful manuscript, the angel of death. These angels are all found in the Bible as well. Two other famous angels mentioned by name in the Quran are Arud and Marud, who are said to have taught magic in Babylon. These latter two figures are conspicuously absent from the Bible, but parallels have nevertheless been suggested with other traditions of the past, as for instance the Zoroastrian. As for the Quranic word for angel, namely Malak, it evidently echoes the Hebrew and Biblical Malak and derives like it from the Semitic root al a -ka, which means to send. Indeed, one of the primary functions of angels in the Quran, as in the Bible, is that of being God's messengers. Surah 35 opens, for example, with the following line, I quote, All praise is due to Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth, who made the angels messengers having wings, two or three or four. As a matter of fact, as was rightly pointed out by Gabriel Said Reynolds in his recent contribution to the new edition of the Encyclopedia of Islam, the Quran does not resolve an important ambiguity since acting as a messenger of God is also a function that the Holy Book of Islam attributes to the, prophet who are, to the prophets who are human messengers. And the most prominent of these, of course, is the prophet Muhammad himself. This said, Angels in the Quran also perform a great variety of other functions which prophets do not share with them. Some of them, presumably a multitude, are scribes appointed by God to record the unseen actions of every human being. Many authors, the Quran cites the figure of 3,000, are warriors promised by God to assist the community of believers. We find angels punishing the souls of the sinners and driving them into the furnace of hell, and angels escorting those of the righteous to the gate of the heavenly gardens. The text also refers to the armies of angels surrounding the throne of God in the heavens, or even carrying it, eternally praising and worshipping him. In various parts of the Quran, the story is also told of the angels summoned by God to prostrate before Adam the father of mankind, and the disobedience of Iblis, that is to say, Shaitan or Satan, the devil. 
One of these passages reads, I quote, Then we said to the angels, Prostrate to Adam. So they prostrated, except for Iblis. He was not of those who prostrated. Allah said, What prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? Satan said, I'm better than him. You created me from fire and created him from clay. End of quote. According to the Islamic revelation, Iblis was not an angel, but a genie, that is, one of those other supernatural creatures of God, which, like humans, but unlike angels, were endowed with free will and which the text indeed describes as created from fire. In contrast to this, it may be observed with Gabriel Said Reynolds that the Quran remains completely silent on the way angels themselves were created. Let us now turn to what is technically called Hadith literature, namely this enormous bulk of Islamic prophetic traditions and their commentaries, which were collected and transmitted by scholars throughout cen the centuries during the Middle Ages, and which, for angelology as for countless other matters in Islam, compensate for what is not explicitly mentioned in the Quranic revelation. One example will suffice to show how rich this Hadith literature is when it concerns angels and the beliefs they have generated among the Muslims. I refer here to a book called Haba'ik fi Akhbar al-Mala'ik, The Arrangement of the Traditions about Angels, a work compiled in the 15th century during the Mamluk period by the Egyptian author Jalal ad-Din as suyuti In this impressive collection of about 750 prophetic traditions exclusively dealing with angels, we find, for instance, that a far greater number of individual angels are named than in the Quran. Thus, in addition to Michael, Gabriel, Harut and Marut, and the angel of death, we now find sections devoted also to Israfil, the bearers of the throne, the spirit, Ridwan, Malik, the, guardi the guardians of the fire, the noble watching scribes, Ismail, the cockerel, Munkar and Nakir once again, the angel of the mountains, to name just a short selection of them all. We also find in these traditions the custom of considering Michael, Gabriel and the angel of death and Israfil these latter not mentioned in the Quran, as the four archangels of Islamic angelology. As for Gabriel, he is now clearly identified as the angel who brought the book to the Prophet Muhammad, a role that the text of the Quran does not assign him with any explicit form. In another video, I shall tell you more about that. <laughs>